In this video, we're going to explore one of the applications of the integral. As you know, an integral is simply the area under a curve. If we expand that into three dimensions, however, it becomes the area or the volume underneath a surface. In two dimensions is the area under a plane. In three dimensions, it becomes a volume. So we're actually going to use a triple integral to actually prove the function for the volume of a cone with radius r and height h. If you recall from your uh, high school classes, the volume of a cone, oh, excuse me, volume of cone is equal to one third times pi times the radius squared times the height. There are various ways you can actually get to this. You can use this Cartesian coordinates, you can use cylindrical coordinates, you can take the integral of a line around about an axis in order to get a cone or in order to get a cone. All these require various other conversion formulas. However, today we're going to use a triple integral in this basis form using cylindrical coordinates in order to do that. The reason we're going to use cylindrical coordinates is because the entire shape is perfectly symmetrical about the z-axis. Makes it much, much easier in that regard. In Cartesian coordinates, we integrate over with respect to y, x, y, and z to the actual bounds of the object. And that will give you your volume of that object. In cylindrical coordinates, you're going to integrate with respect to r, theta, and z. But due to the conversion factor in between cylindrical and Cartesian coordinates, you also have to multiply the base term times the radius. Okay? So radius is simply our distance perpendicular to the z-axis. Our theta is simply the angle in relation to the z-axis based on wherever we define our origin. So down here will be the r-axis. And then z is simply the height vertical separation to our particular surface. So this is your z height along the z-axis. We define our maximum height of our cone as h and our maximum radius of our cone as capital R. So how are we going to integrate this? How are we going to bound this integral? Well, Theta is pretty simple, right? We're going from zero to two pi, two pi radians. That's 100. That's 360 degrees. That means we're going all the way around the z-axis. R is likewise pretty simple to bound. We're going from zero at the top of the cone all the way to capital R at the bottom of the cone, our base. Z, however, is a little bit t more difficult. We're going from zero to a surface, to the side of our cone that's slanted in. So if we take this and project it into three into two dimensions, we'll have something that looks like this. We'll have a triangle. So this will be our z-axis and this will be our r-axis here. It's a two-dimensional slice of our cone. So up here, this will be h. Down here, this will be r. If you remember from Cartesian coordinates, the base equation for a line is y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope and b is the y-intercept. Well, we can simply translate that directly into cylindrical coordinates. So we can equal z equals mr plus b, where m is our slope and b is our z-intercept. So in this case, z, our, our surface that we're going to, that the cone is bounded by, is equal to z equals, and what's our equation for our slope? That's rise over run. So we're going negative h over r times r. h is our rise, capital R is our run. We're going downward, so the slope is negative times r, plus our z-intercept of h. Or, another way to rewrite this is z equals h minus 
h over r times r. So that's actually what we're going to be integrating to. h minus h over r times r. So let's set this up and evaluate it. R dz d theta dr. 0 to h minus h over r times r. 0 to 2 pi, 0 to r. May ask why did I arrange it this way? You can actually integrate these in any particular order. So you can go dr, d theta, dz if you want to. However, this arrangement in this particular function makes the math a little easier simply because we do not have any thetas or z's in our, any of our bounds. Therefore, we're not going to have to evaluate that integral over the entire range. It's just going to become, it's going to be a constant with respect to that particular variable. So we do not have to evaluate it from 0 to h minus h over r times r or 0 to 2 pi because we do not have those expressions in our bounds. So we'll actually evaluate it only in this last particular integral and uh, it just makes the math a little easier. And you'll see it as we go through the problem. So we'll take this and evaluate it uh, with respect to z, our first integral. So we'll evaluate r with respect to z. So we're simply going to get r Excuse me, go ahead and write my integral signs first. 0 to r, 0 to 2 pi of h minus h over r times r times r, 0 to h minus h over r times r, d theta dr. All right, so like I said, z is going to go from 0 to h minus h over r times r. We don't have a z in our function, therefore it becomes a constant, and we do not have to evaluate this section. So we have 0 to r, 0 to 2 pi, r times h minus h over r times r d theta dr. Okay, so let's evaluate that. Now we're going to get 0 to r of 2 pi r times h minus h over r times r, where theta will go, be evaluated from 0. 2 pi dr. Once again, there's no theta inside this expression here, so it doesn't matter. We don't have to evaluate it. We can't, so it's a constant. So therefore, we're going to have 0 to r of 2 pi r times h minus h over r times r dr. Now note, the next variable we're going to integrate is with respect to r. So we do have r's in this expression, so we're going to have to act, so it's not going to be a constant that simply drops down out of our integral. Additionally, we have this r broken up. We can actually consolidate the r's into terms, therefore we don't have to use the product rule with integration. It makes it a little bit easier simply to do this in this expression. So therefore, this is also equal to 0 times r. 2 pi is a constant, so we can actually pull it out of the integral. And then we'll distribute the r through hr minus hr squared over capital R dr. So this is the function we're actually going to evaluate here. Okay, so what does that equal? Well, now it's going to equal 2 pi times hr squared over 2 minus hr cubed over 3r 
and then we'll have to evaluate small r from zero all the way to big R. Okay? So that's going to be 2 pi. And then in this case, we'll substitute in our big R for our little r's whenever we're evaluating 2 big R. H R squared over 2 minus H R cubed over 3R minus 2 pi times H times 0 squared over 2 minus H times 0 cubed over 3R there. So we can see here that both these terms are going to go to 0 here which is going to cause this entire expression to go to 0 that equals zero. So therefore we have to evaluate and simplify this term. And that'll be our answer. So 2 pi times hr squared over 2 minus hr cubed over 3r is going to be our volume of our cone. It's going to equal volume. That's the overall volume this within, within this surface. So this r is going to cause this exponential to go to a 2, which is going to equal 2 pi times hr squared over 2 minus hr squared over 3. Lowest common denominator inside this is 6. So therefore, we need to multiply this expression by 2 over 2, and this, ex excuse me, the left expression by 3 over 3, and the right expression by 2 over 2. We're multiplying by 1, just expanding the fractions out so we can actually subtract them and evaluate them. So that's going to be equal to 2 pi times three hr squared over 6 minus 2 hr squared over 6 so then our volume is going to be equal to 2 pi times 1 times h r squared over 6 which equals 2 pi r squared h over 6. We can simplify that down into pi r squared h over 3, which is equal to the volume of the cone. It's the exact same function we started with that I gave you. And that's how we can actually use a triple integral to derive the value for the volume of a cone.